Let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22. Here we're going to continue to read and study about heaven or the new Jerusalem as it's called in this passage. And I would remind you that the new Jerusalem is both a city and a bride. Or we could say that it's a place and a people. The people of God and the place of God. That's heaven. The new Jerusalem will be characterized by the presence of God, by the glory of God, and by the work of the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. The people and the place will be holy and pure, beautiful and valuable, safe and stable. We saw all of that in verses 9 through 21. And we'll see even more about the new Jerusalem, about heaven, and the rest of this passage that runs from verse 22 in chapter 21 through verse 5 of chapter 22. Follow along with me as I read. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations." No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. In talking about the characteristics of heaven for the last two Sundays, the emphasis has been on the things that will be. And there's still some of that in this part of the text, and we're go either going to get to it later today or Possibly next Sunday, you know how that goes with me. But to begin with, uh, we're going to focus on the things that will not be. The no's when it comes to heaven, the new Jerusalem, both the place and the people. Five no's, in fact, as in these things will not be in heaven. First, in heaven, there will be no temple. In heaven, there will be no temple. Look at verse 22 again there in chapter 21. John writes, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty, and the Lamb. I alluded to this last week, the fact that there would be 
no temple in heaven. Before that, at the beginning of chapter 21, I said that there would be a new temple in heaven in the sense that there would be no old temple. And what I mean by all of that is that the new temple in heaven will not be a building. Heaven then, you see, will be the fulfillment of what the old physical building of the temple represented as in heaven, the presence of God will be everywhere and in everyone. When the first old physical temple building was constructed and Solomon dedicated that upon its completion, he alluded to the fact that it did not represent all of the presence of God or everywhere that God was. He said in 1 Kings 8, 27, Heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I, Solomon, have built. In heaven, the whole earth, not just a building, not just a room in a building, will be filled with God. We saw that earlier in this passage with the measurement of the new Jerusalem revealing that it was or will be a perfect cube, a perfect cube taking us back to the Holy of Holies in the temple, which was a perfect cube, meaning that all of the new creation, all of the new Jerusalem, all of heaven, the place and the people, will be the Holy of Holies. As verse 22 says here, its temple, that is the temple of this new Jerusalem heaven, its temple is the Lord and the Lamb. That is the Lord and the Lamb. God will be everywhere in the city. And very quickly I want you to notice the equality between God the Father and God the Son. So much so that we could say about the Lamb that He is the Lord. The Lamb is Lord. Something that we've seen before numerous times in Revelation. And something that's taught throughout the Bible. The deity of Christ and in that the trinity of our God. Now back to uh, what we were talking about before I, I noted that. With no temple building, we're reminded that the new Jerusalem will be a different kind of city. Because in the ancient world, there was no such thing as a city without temples. There was no such thing as we saw last week as cities without walls for the most part. There was no such thing certainly as cities without temples. The new Jerusalem will be a different kind of city. And heaven will also be a different kind of world. We see that in the second note. Which is that in heaven there will be no sun or moon. Look at verse 23 in chapter 21. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. In the same way that the purpose of the physical temple will be fulfilled or completed or exhausted in heaven, the purpose of physical sources of light will be fulfilled as well. The sun and the moon are necessary. They are essential for life now. For life in this world. And it's been that way from creation. We note that from Genesis chapter 1, which 
records for us the significant part that the sun and the moon played in God's original creation. But the sun and the moon, you see, will be unnecessary, will be unessential in heaven, in the new creation, in the world to come. The sun and the moon ultimately, like the temple building, point to a greater reality, to a greater coming reality. And in this case, the sun and the moon now point to the greater light and the greater glory of God, which is always necessary, which is always essential, and which is and will be always present, especially in heaven. God's light, God's glory is present now and it's apparent now but because of fallenness and sin and sinful people it can be missed. But in heaven there will be no missing the glory of God. There will be no missing the light of God and because of this the sun and the moon won't be needed. The verse we just read said, no need for these things. The sun and the moon won't be needed any more than you would need a flashlight to find your way back to your car when we get out of the service this morning. Do you need a flashlight in the sunlight? Can you really even see a flashlight in the sunlight? Why? It's because the sunlight is a far greater light than a flashlight. And it will be the same way in heaven. The sun and the moon, the light that they provide, passing away in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies like Isaiah 60. Because the light of God, the light of the sun, the S-O-N, the true light, the light of the world, is an incomparably greater and more powerful light. We see the same thing in chapter 22, verse 5, the second part of which says, They will need no light or lamp of sun, for the Lord God will be their light. Throughout the book of Revelation, and in particular, the last two chapters of Revelation, we see the Lord and therefore heaven, the place that he resides, described in terms of light. Brilliant light. It's the same way that God is described in the Old Testament. The same way that God revealed himself or manifested himself in the Old Testament and therefore the way that God was understood by his people, the people of Israel during the time of the Old Testament. And in heaven, his light will fill the new temple, which is all of the new creation, just like it filled the old temple in the old covenant. The light of God and the light of heaven brings us to the next note, the third note, which is in heaven, there will be no night. One of my favorite songs come out in recent years, and by recent I mean last 20 years or so, is the great song, No More Night based on what we find here. First, in verse 25 of chapter 21, it says, And its gates, that is, the gates in the wall of the city, which we talked about the past two weeks, and its gates will never be shut by day. Now, that was unheard of in the ancient world. All these ancient cities had walls, and in these walls were gates, and every day there was a time when those gates were shut when those day, gates were closed. But here, about heaven, it says the gates will never be shut. Why? 
because of what we read in the next part of the verse. And there will be no night there. Same thing that's said in verse 5 of chapter 22, the first part, and night will be no more. Therefore, in heaven, there will be no need to shut the gates. You see, in the ancient world, they did shut the gates to the city every day. That is, every night. Because the night time was the time of darkness. And darkness was the time when thieves broke in and stole. When enemies came and invaded. When terrors out there became terrors in here. But in heaven there will be no darkness. Either literal darkness or figurative darkness. In heaven there will be no thieves that we need to be on the lookout for. In heaven there will be no evil as there will be no deeds of darkness. In heaven there will just be light. Brilliant light. Literal and figurative light. Verse 24 of chapter 21 says, By its light the nations will walk. That is, the nations will no longer walk in the darkness, but rather in the light. The fact that there will be no night in heaven means there will be no nightmares in heaven. There will be no monsters in heaven, no beasts. There will be no enemies in heaven. There will be nothing scary in heaven. Nothing to fear in heaven. Because as we've seen the past two weeks, heaven will be perfectly safe and perfectly secure. And that in part is because of the fourth no that we come to now. In heaven, there will be no sin or sinners. In heaven there will be no sin or sinners. Look at verse 27 of chapter 21. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. And this is in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies and passages like Isaiah 35, 8, Isaiah 52, 1, among others. You say, well, I get that there will be no sin in heaven, but no sinners in heaven. You see, if there was something unclean, that is sin in heaven. If there was someone detestable or false, that is Sinners in heaven, it or they would make heaven unclean, unholy, untrue. It and they would make heaven dark, not light. It would make heaven imperfect. It would make heaven not new or improved at all. If there will be sin and sinners in heaven, then heaven won't be heaven. Sin and sinners would ruin heaven just like they ruined the first heaven and the first earth, the first Jerusalem, the first creation. And we've seen this Unfortunate truth, at least in regards to the people before. Not so long ago in verse 8 of chapter 21, we read and studied, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will not be in heaven, the new Jerusalem. Their portion rather will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And I told you then 
that heaven is a few plagues. Paul wrote about this same truth more than once. One example being 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Paul wrote there, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul wrote about the same thing in his letter to the church at Galatia, Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before. Those who do or who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In fact... According to Jesus, these will be cast into the outer darkness. The outer darkness meaning here, outside the gate, outside the wall, outside the city, outside and apart from heaven. Now look at verse 27 again in chapter 21. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. These are the few, not the few and the proud, the few and the humble. Those that are written in the book, the Lamb's book of life, a book that we've seen referenced already in chapter 20, verse 12, when it spoke about that day of judgment and how the book of life would be open, revealing those who had life and salvation. That book was implied in chapter 20, verse 15, when it spoke about those who were not found written in the Lamb's book of life who would then be cast into the lake of fire. Those in the book will not be sinners in heaven. Did you hear me, sinners? Did you hear me, sinners who were turning from your sins and trusting on Jesus alone to save you in heaven? We will no longer be sinners. We will be former sinners. Because those in the book are those who have been justified. That is, those who have been saved through repentance and faith in Christ. Through turning from their sins and trusting on Christ for salvation. In heaven then, we, the justified, will be sanctified. Completely. Or we could put it this way in heaven, unlike here, we will be glorified. What does it mean to be glorified? Well, it means, in short, to be like Christ. We will finally in heaven be conformed to the image of Christ. We will have the very holiness of Christ the moral perfection of Christ. We will have been delivered from the practice of sin, from the presence of sin, from the power of sin. You see, the being conformed to the image of Christ, becoming holy as He is holy, is the good purpose for which God saved us in the first place. 
And it's the good purpose towards which God is working in all things, according to Romans 8, 28. You know, we quote that verse often. We know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But in quoting that, what many don't realize is the good that God is always working towards is not good as we might define good. It's in all these horrible things of life, God is working to conform us to the image of Christ. And one day, he will, and that day will be in heaven. That's how there will be no sin for sinners in heaven. And that brings us then to the fifth note. In heaven, there will be no curse. Verse 3 of chapter 22. No longer will there be anything a curse, or could be translated, no longer will there be a curse. No longer will there be the curse. And that goes all the way back, the curse, the curse, goes all the way back to Genesis 2.17, when God gave Adam upon placing him in the garden, one command. You can eat from the fruit of the trees, of all of the trees in the garden, and surely there were many, hundreds, maybe thousands. But from the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of the good and evil, you may not eat. For on the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. God spoke there about the curse that would come from disobeying him. And after Adam and Eve ate from the tree, what we're reading here in Revelation 22 then goes back to Genesis 3 verses 14 through 19 when God judged or announced the curse upon Adam and Eve and Satan. And in announcing a curse upon Adam and Eve in them, announcing a curse upon all that would come from them, all after them, and everything around them, even mentioning the ground being cursed. Well, it was the curse of death. Physical and spiritual death. This curse caused everything bad that precedes death. And that leads to death. I'm talking about the hard and difficult things of life. The trials and tribulations of life. The things that we talked about earlier in Revelation. And the seven seals and the seven trumpets. Things like anti-Christian government. Anti-Christian religion. Anti-Christian culture. Things like violence. Murder and war, things like economic hardship and poverty and oppression, things like famine and pestilence and disease like cancer and COVID, natural disasters which we understand from Revelation and the Bible aren't so natural at all. Talking about the results of sin, the fall, the curse. And the good news here is that in heaven, that curse which has brought about all those things will be no more. Meaning all those things will be no more. The curse and all that came with it will have been removed and reversed. We saw that earlier in chapter 21 verse 4 when it said God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former thing the things of this world of this life under the curse have passed away so in heaven there will be no temple no sun or moon 
no night, no sin or sinners, and no curse. Now that we've seen what will not be, let's come back to what will be in heaven. Six things we find here. First, in heaven there will be the glory and honor of the kings and the kingdoms of the world. Look at verse 24 in chapter 21. By its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Verse 26, they will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. In chapter 21, we've already seen that heaven will be characterized by the glory of God. Verse 10 said, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. Now, we see that heaven will also include the glory and the honor of the kings and the nations or the kings and the kingdoms of this world, of the first earth. Now that might be surprising to you, especially when we consider what we've studied and seen before in Revelation in regards to the kings and the kingdoms of this world who throughout Revelation have been associated with Antichrist rather than Christ, have been associated with anti-Christian government, anti-Christian religion, anti-Christian culture rather than the church. These kings and kingdoms of the world having been opposed to Christ and His church. But remember... We've also seen in Revelation that God is saving a people for Himself, a people made up of all kinds of people, even powerful people, even leaders from the nations or the kingdoms of the world into His kingdom in fulfillment to His promise to Abraham and His covenant with Abraham where He said, through you. All of the families, all of the peoples, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. In fulfillment to so many other Old Testament passages, one example being the book of Micah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, in which we read these words. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. And it shall be lifted up above the hills. And peoples, nations, shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. You see what he's describing here? is the procession of the nations to the Lord. To the new Jerusalem, to heaven. Whereas what we've seen previously in Revelation was the nations being gathered against the Lord and against His people. So different here. Why gathering? Going on in verse 2, that He may teach us His ways and that we may walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and I would add there, in light of Revelation, from the new Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. When? In heaven. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk each in the name of its God, but we, the one people of God, will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and forever. 
We saw this same thing earlier in the book of Revelation. Chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. John wrote, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. These then are the kings. And the kingdoms of this world that will bring their glory into heaven. Now, there are two ways to think about what the kings and kingdoms of the world bringing their glory into the kingdom of heaven means. One is that the things that we have glorified and the things that we have been glorified for will resound to the glory of God in heaven. That is, the things that we have glorified and the things that we've been glorified for in this world will turn into God being glorified in heaven. For He, God alone, is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. And in heaven, brothers and sisters, we will give it to Him. We will give it all to Him. We will give our very best, every bit of it to Him. The second way to think about this is that the glorious things of this world, of this age, the truly glorious things of this time, the first creation, will carry over into the new creation, will carry over into the world to come will carry over into heaven. Now we all understand that we live in a sinful, fallen world. I don't think I have to convince you of that. If I do, just listen to the news. Read Facebook. You really want to be convinced? Get on Twitter. Our world is not characterized by the glory of God. But in this sinful, fallen world that is not characterized by the glory of God, there are still glorious things. Things that are good and noble and true. Things that still reflect the glory of God. There are people even lost people in whom we see shadows of the God who made them in His glorious image. I'm talking now about the best of things like art and music and literature. I'm talking about the best of work and activities. The best of human achievements and human relationships and even the best of human culture or cultures and human government. I'm talking about things which are done with great skill and ability and talent that cause all of us to go, wow, that's special, that's good. Things that are done with great skill and ability and talent which has been given by God who Himself is skilled and talented and able. I'm talking about things which even in this fallen world help and heal and give hope and give joy. I'm talking about Parts of the goodness of the creation of a good God. Things which, like the temple and the sun and the moon, point to a greater coming reality. Great things that should cause us to not merely praise them, but to praise the God who made them. Or, 
the God who made the people who made them. These glorious things in our current world should point us to our glorious God. And they will in heaven. In fulfillment of, again, so many Old Testament passages, but one in particular would be Isaiah chapter 60, beginning in verse 1. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you. And his glory shall be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light. And kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hill. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. What would the sea represent there? The world, the abundance, the great things, the glory and the honor of the nations shall be turned to you. The wealth, the glory and the honor of the nations. Shall come to you in heaven. There will be the glory of the kings and the kingdoms of this world. Second, in heaven there will be the river of life. Chapter 22 verse 1 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street, the golden street of the city. This takes us back yet again to a place we've been several times before in previous weeks and that is in our minds to Ezekiel's vision which he recorded in chapter 40 and following in Ezekiel, a vision in which he saw the new Jerusalem, a great city surrounded by a great wall, God and his people in it. Here it takes us back to Ezekiel 47, in which Ezekiel saw a great river flowing from the throne of God, not just to the city, but to the nation. You remember that vision? People have been so baffled by it over the years. The further the water got away from the throne, the deeper it got. First it was to the ankles and then to the waist and then higher and higher. And as it did, as it flowed to the nations, what it brought to them was life. Pictured best, by the part of the vision in which Ezekiel says that it brought life, living creatures, even to the Dead Sea. It brought life even over death. You see, life was the symbolism of the river there that Ezekiel saw, and it's the symbolism of the river here. That John sees. That's why we speak of it as the river of life, or that's why it's spoken of here as the water of life. That's why it's spoken of elsewhere in the Bible as living water, the water of eternal life. That life being the life of God, life like God possesses, not just a quantity of life or length of life, but a quality of life. This eternal life being what we might call salvation. The blessing of God. The same water, the same river that Jesus told the Samaritan woman about in John chapter 4. Do you remember that? When he asked her for a drink of water. 
she sort of bucked at that. He said, you knew who it was that was asking you for a drink of water. You would ask me for a drink, and I would give you living water that would rise up within you and become a great river so that you would never thirst again. It's the same water, the same river that he spoke about in John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. He said there on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And of course he said this about the Spirit, according to the next verse in John. The Spirit who gives life and salvation, the blessing of God. We saw this alluded to before in the book of Revelation chapter 7. Verse 17, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And what will he do as our shepherd? He will guide them to springs of living water. We saw it not so long ago, earlier in chapter 21. Verse 6, to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. You see, the new creation... The new Jerusalem, heaven, will be characterized by life. Unlike this world, which is characterized by death. Read Genesis 5 sometimes. This man was born. He grew up and had these sons. He lived this many years. And every one of them, with the exception of one, it ends with this. And he died. For all of us, that will be our end as well. We will die, our end here. For it is appointed unto man to die, and after this the judgment. But heaven will be characterized by life, not death. Life represented by this river that John sees. The life of God. Life from God. Note here that the river of life flows from the throne of God. Contrary to the song that we sing, which says flows by the throne of God. No, it doesn't merely flow by the throne of God. It flows from the throne. Meaning that God is the source of this life, this salvation, this blessing. The psalmist spoke of it in Psalm 46, 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. Satisfied, Their thirst will be quenched. We see more about life in the next thing. The third thing in heaven, there will also be the tree of life. Again, chapter 22, verse 2. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life. So, so note here the vision. He sees this tree, or what he calls a tree, on both sides, both banks of the river. Likely indicating that it's not just a tree that he sees, but like Ezekiel, multiple trees that he sees. Groves of trees. Trees with 12 kinds of fruit. The symbolism of the number 12 being the people of God. All of the people of God eating from this tree or these trees. Yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. Now I said that takes us back to Ezekiel 2. But it also takes us back much further than Ezekiel to Genesis 
to the Garden of Eden where there was the tree of life. Not just anywhere in the garden, but where in the garden? In the center of the garden. And when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because of their sin, access to that tree is what they lost. They were cut off from the tree of life, kept away from the tree of life. So what then does this vision of John communicate to us? This. In heaven. We will finally make it back to the garden. We will get back into the garden. Back to the tree of life. Where we can and where we will eat in a manner of speaking the fruit or the fruits of that tree. Now, if you want to have fun, we can speculate about what the fruits might be. I'm hoping it's more than just fruits. I mean, I'm almost convinced that pizza will be one of the fruits and chicken fajitas will be another and bacon will be one. My mom's biscuits would have to be up there. No, we we don't know about that. We don't even know of speaking about literal food here. But what we do know is that what John is seeing communicates to us that by this, whatever it is, likely a reference to Christ and salvation that we find in Him, we will be healed. Now you hear healed and you say, so does that mean that we'll get sick and we'll have to go to the doctor, this tree, and be healed? No, being healed means we will be given life. We will be saved through this. Once more indicating no more curse in heaven. In the words of Jesus, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And you know how we'll be filled? By the tree of life. Fourth, in heaven, there will be the throne of God. That was just referenced in verse 2. We see it again in verse 3. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. Note here that the throne is the center of heaven. We saw that earlier in chapter 4 and chapter 5. The throne, of fact, is the center of everything, even now. The throne of God is the center of the universe and all that goes on in it. And that's a great comfort to the people of God when we consider all that's going on in the universe and the world. That it's not outside of the jurisdiction of the throne. As we saw a moment ago, the source of life, the river, salvation and blessing comes from it. From the throne, from the Lord and from the Lamb. From the authority of the rule of the Lamb. And this is not just true for the future, it's true today. Life, true life, comes from ordering our lives by the rule of God. Really living takes place when we submit to the rule or the throne of God. His rule being found in the Word of God. Beginning with the command that we find in his word to repent of our sins, to turn from them and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Then as we trust on him, obeying his other commands, seeking to do that, striving to do that, and repenting and believing when we do not. Contrary to what you've heard or maybe thought, God's rule doesn't keep us from living. God's rule leads us to living, to real living. Read the first psalm sometime. It leads us to living as we obey it. Now speaking of obedience, in heaven, fifth thing, there will be worship. Again, verse 3, and his servants will worship him. 
or his servants will serve him. However you translate that word, it's connected to the work of the priest, which is what we are and what we will be according to Revelation 1, as we've seen numerous times. Revelation 5, 9, 10 says we're a kingdom of priests. The idea here is that in heaven, look at me, we will work. Some people think about heaven about like they think about this, boring. When can we get out of here? Some people are thinking, I don't know if I want to go to hell, but I don't know if I want to go to heaven either because if it's laying around on a cloud strumming a harp forever, that doesn't sound so good. And look, if I'm being honest, that doesn't sound so good to me. I'm not a big fan of harp music. I love music. But if it means me strumming a harp on a cloud forever, that doesn't sound grand. Maybe to you, not to many. But that's not heaven. In heaven we will work. It's how we will worship. It's how we will serve. In heaven, some people think it's like retirement where you're delivered from work. That's not heaven. Work is not a part of the fall. It's not a result of sin. Work preceded the fall and sin. Genesis 2.15, God put Adam in the garden to work before he ever sinned. Work is a good thing. It's a God thing. In heaven, we won't be delivered from work. We will be delivered to Work. Work apart from the curse. Work apart from opposition and frustration. Work apart from the weeds and the sweat that are mentioned in Genesis 3. Work in heaven will be fulfilling and fun. Work in heaven will be worship. And if this is what we're going to do in heaven... And as we've already seen, if this is what is going on in heaven now, surely it's what we should be doing here and now. Worshiping, serving, sacrificing, working in preparation for the worship and work of heaven. The primary work of heaven being the primary work that God gave to Adam and Eve. What was their primary job? To rule. Genesis 2, somewhere in there. Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28. I say the primary work being to rule, or as it says here and elsewhere in Revelation, to reign. Last part of verse 5 in chapter 22. And they will reign or rule forever and ever with the Lord, for the Lord, in fulfillment of His promise to the church at Laodicea. To those who conquer, I will give you the right to sit on my throne just as the Father has placed me on the throne. In fulfillment of Daniel 7, 18, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. So again, we see heaven in terms of the garden, taking us back to it, getting us back into it. And we see it once more in the sixth and final thing, which is in heaven, there will be relationship to and fellowship with God. Chapter 22, verse 4, they will see his face. Seeing God's face speaks of a new relationship with him, a new fellowship with him, intimate relationship and fellowship with him more intimate than ever before like Adam and Eve had in the garden before the fall this being what they lost when they were kicked out of the garden in heaven it will be found and regained because seeing him face to face means we will have more knowledge of God than we've ever had before and we will have more knowledge of God because we will be more in the likeness of God than ever before. This is what John wrote about in his first epistle. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. 
Beloved, we are God's children now. We are. We have relationship and fellowship with God now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. See what he's saying? We have relationship and fellowship now, but not like then. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we will see him as he is. I know what time it is, but I don't want you to miss this. Seeing God's face. His glory unveiled is an incredible thought. Almost unbelievable in light of what the Bible says before this. In Exodus 33, 20, God said to Moses, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Seeing the unveiled glory of God has been and would be even now a death sentence. God said this to Moses, a man who had greater intimacy with God, greater relationship and fellowship with God than anybody else. But even Moses didn't see God's face, that is, his unveiled glory. When he saw the glory of God, he had to be hidden in the cleft of the rock. Only then he saw the backside of the glory of God. But in heaven, no cleft. No rock, no backside, no barriers, no safeguards in heaven. Close, personal, total, full, complete communion with the Lord unlike anything we've ever known. Matthew 5, 8, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Vern Poitras put it this way, We can enjoy a vision of God that was not possible while we were contaminated with sin. And then the last part of chapter 22, verse 4, and his name will be on their forehead. Once more, it's about relationship, about belonging to the Lord, about how we will be his forever, about a new and improved relationship and fellowship, a perfect love that we will have with the Lord. In fulfillment to these words of Christ. John 14, 3. And if I go, I'll prepare a place for you and come back for you so that where I am, there you may be also. In heaven, there will be the glory and the honor of the kings and the kingdoms of the world. There will be the river of life. There will be the tree of life. There will be the throne of God. There will be worship, service, work. There will be relationship and fellowship with God. And you combine that with what will not be in heaven. And what do you have? Perfect place. A perfect people. The people of God in the place of God with God forever. If you have repented of your sins and believed on Jesus and even now today are repenting and believing on Him, be encouraged from this to keep on because this brother and sister is our destiny. This is where we are going. This is what we will be. This is the hope of the book of Revelation, in the midst of the tribulation, in the midst of persecution, our hope, the Christian hope, is heaven. If you've never repented of your sins and believed on Jesus, if you are not repenting and believing on Him, do so today. Do so right now. Cry out to Him from your heart to His Confess your sin. Receive His forgiveness and salvation.
trust that He is Lord and Savior. Trust that He has lived the life that God demands of you. Trust that He has died as a sacrifice for your sins. That He has risen from the grave for your life. And He will forgive you for all your sins and make you right with God and give you eternal life. Do it today for heaven. Remembering that Jesus is the only way. I'd love to talk with you about it. Stand with me. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.